Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the spawn of the Gitrog monster, Grawlnock the Omnivore. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated while I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders from Crimson Vow you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Grawlnock the Omnivore is a 3-3 frog that costs 2, a green and a blue with the following abilities. Whenever a frog you control attacks, mill 3 cards. Whenever a permanent is put into your graveyard from your library, exile it with a croak counter on it. You may play lands and cast spells from among cards you own in exile with croak counters on them. Right out of the gate, we can see that Grawlnock spawns in with a midweight CMC, reasonable stats for the cost, and a set of abilities that make him and his amphibian brethren quite adept at chewing through our own deck and turning it into value. His first ability is straightforward enough, milling us for 3 whenever he or any other frogs we control attack, regardless whether those attacks even connect or deal damage, which makes it an efficient and repeatable combat-focused way to mill ourselves turn after turn so long as we keep attacking. This then leads nicely into his other abilities, which exile any permanents that would be milled or otherwise sent to our grave from our deck with crow counters on them, allowing us to cast those spells and play those lands, effectively turning our exile into a second hand with no hand limit so long as Grawlnock is in play to provide us with a huge amount of options as we keep milling ourselves. Not to mention, because we're exiling those cards ourselves, we're more or less immune to most conventional forms of graveyard hate, which adds an extra layer of protection to those exiled cards until we're ready to play them. So, aiming to take full advantage of how quickly Grawlnock and his spawn are able to churn through our deck, this build will be a self-mill-focused one, aiming to deck ourselves as quickly as possible and either use Laboratory Maniac or Jace Wielder of Mysteries to win the game when we do so. As since they're both permanents that can be exiled by our commander as we mill them, it will be almost impossible for our opponents to touch them until we're ready to cast them. That means we'll be running plenty of frogs to take advantage of the mill our commander provides, as well as honorary frogs thanks to Changeling to give us even more opportunities to mill ourselves. And of course, we'll also be running traditional forms of self-mill to help chew through our deck without having to rely entirely on our commander. And while this deck primarily cares about permanence, we'll still be running a handful of instants and sorceries, most of which will have flashbacks so we can cast them from our grave if we happen to mill them to still get value out of them, as well as retrieving them with several recursion sources we'll be running in order to get them or any other key pieces we need back to our hand. Finally, since Grawlnock is the key to us being able to use our exiled cards, we'll need to do our best to keep him on the field for as long as possible. So we'll be running plenty of permanents that can keep him alive through destruction, as well as making him untargetable to ensure that this frog remains as slippery as possible against our opponent's removal and wipes. Now it's time for the spawn of the Gitrog monster to lead his cultists into battle. Behind those cold, soulless eyes lurking a sinister intelligence that aims to drown both the temple of the false god Toxrel and then the entire whole of Nephalia to claim as his domain. Or he could just be hungry. Either way, our opponents will be the ones croaking once he's through with them. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting in the CMC1 slot, the first half brings us two frogs with Spore Frog and Moth Dust Changeling. Spore Frog is a 1 1 that we can sack to prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn, both functioning as a source of mill alongside our commander and a way to protect our other frogs by sacking itself immediately after it swings to allow us to mill ourselves safely on otherwise stalled board states. Mothless Changeling is another 1-1 one -one who's an honorary frog thanks to Changeling that can have us tap another untapped creature we control to grant it flying until the end of the turn, making it an evasive frog that we can reliably get over blockers to proc our commander's mill. The latter half of this slot then brings us Elvish Mystic and Lana War Elves, both of which are 1-1s one -ones that we can tap for a green, serving as a pair of cheap mana dorks that we can either drop early to get our commander out faster, or play from exile once milled to give a boost to our mana curve in the later game. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we start off with some more ramp sources in the form of Sakura Tribe Elder and Dreamscape Artist. Sakura Tribe Elder is a 1-1 one -one that we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, serving as a cheap source of land-based ramp that we have access to if we draw into it or mill with our commander. Dreamscape Artist is another 1-1 one -one that lets us pay 2, a blue, tap it, discard a card, and sack a land to put two basic lands from our deck into play, effectively making it a repeatable harrow to help ramp us and get more cards out of our deck at instant speed. Deranged Assistant and Milliken also join us as additional ramp, the former being a 1-1 and the latter a 0-1, both letting us tap them for a colorless and milling us for 1 when we do so, each giving us additional ramp that also helps speed up our self-mill plan. Then we end this slot with Jade Avenger, a 2-2 frog with Bushido 2, effectively making it a 4-4 when blocking or being blocked, 
which usually allows it to swing in safely in the early and mid game to generate us more mill unless our opponents are willing to trade down for it. Now entering the CMC3 slot, we start off with some additional frogs with Croconura, Whip Tongue Frog, and Mistwalker. Croconura is a 1-3 with Reach and Evolve, giving us a decent defensive stat line initially that grows over time as we play our bigger creatures, safely allowing it to swing in as the game progresses. Whip Tongue Frog is another 1-3, this one allowing us to pay a blue to give it flying until the end of the turn, more easily allowing it to swing in and keep milling us regardless of board state. Mistwalker is a 1-4 flyer with Changeling that we can pay 1 in a blue to give it plus 1 minus 1 until the end of the turn, its stat modification being largely irrelevant as we'll be using it primarily as another evasive frog to help us stay on the mill plan. Plaxcaster Frogling then joins us as another frog entrant, this one being a 0-0 with Graft 3 that we can pay 2 to grant target creature with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on its shroud until the end of the turn, serving as a good way to protect our commander from targeted removal if we were able to summon it first or if we are able to get a plus 1 plus 1 counter on him through other means. Moving away from frogs for a moment, we have other green entrants joining us with Reclamation Sage, Spring Bloom Druid, and Eternal Witness. Reclamation Sage is a 2-1 that, when it ETBs, destroys target artifact or enchantment, making it a good source of back row removal on a body to cast from exile once we mill it. Spring Bloom Druid is a 1-1 that, when it ETBs, lets us sack a land to put two basic lands from our deck into play tapped, giving us yet another harrow effect on a body to help us ramp while we keep thinning out our deck. Eternal Witness is a 2-1 that, when it ETBs, lets us put a card from our grave back into our hand, serving as a potent source of recursion to bring back any key pieces we may need to win from the grave if destroyed, or any non-permanent spells that may have been milled by other effects. Then we close out this slot with Laboratory Maniac, a 2-2 that wins us the game if we were to draw a card with no cards left in our library, making it one of the key win cons in this build that we'll need to pivot to protect instead of our commander once the end game starts. Moving on to the CMC4 slot, we start off with Mystic Snake, Frilled Mystic, and Overcharged Amalgam, all three of which have flash and are able to counter a spell when they ETB, the first being a 2-2, the second being a 3-2, and the last being a 3-3 flyer that must exploit to do this but can also counter triggered and activated abilities, all three being good sources of spell disruption that we can play from exile to protect Rolnok and later our win cons. A pair of mill-focused creatures then join our ranks with Shadowkin and Dreamborn Muse. Shadowkin is a 2-2 with Flash that, on our upkeep, mills everyone for 3 and lets us exile one of the milled creature cards to have it transform into a copy of that creature with this ability, providing us with both additional mill and potentially turning into a dangerous threat turn after turn for no further mana investment. Dreamborn Muse is another 2-2 that, on each player's upkeep, has that player mill X cards, X being equal to the number of cards they have in hand, which works nicely for us to mill a high number of cards per turn as we should be casting cards from exile whenever possible so our hands are usually full. Then closing out this slot, we have its last two entrants with Omnifibian and Timeless Witness. Omnifibian is a 3-3 frog that we can tap to turn another creature into a 3-3 frog until the end of the turn, enabling us to turn any tokens we've created or creatures we no longer need into frogs to swing in with and get more self-mill while not risking our more valuable creatures. Timeless Witness is a 2-1 with Eternal Eyes for 5 and double green that, when it ETBs, returns a card from our graveyard back to our hand, serving as another recursion tool, this one being usable from the grave again in the later game to recur another card if needed. Nearly at the end now, the CMC5 slot brings us a pair of frogs with Frog Hemoth and Haze Frog. Frog Hemoth is a 4-4 trampler with haste that, when it deals combat damage, exiles that many cards from the defending player's graveyard, gaining a plus 1 plus 1 counter if it exiles a creature and gaining us 1 life if it exiles a non-creature giving us yet another frog to work alongside our commander, but also being a decent beater and source of graveyard hate in its own right, that will grow into a bigger and bigger threat over time. Haze Frog is a 2-1 with Flash that, when it ETBs, prevents all combat damage that would be dealt by other creatures that turn, effectively serving as a surprise version of Spore Frog to either protect us from incoming damage or enabling us to make cheeky attacks to mill ourselves without losing creatures in the process. Finally, skipping to the CMC7 slot, we have our last creature with Fleet Swallower, a 6-6 that, when it attacks, has target player put the top half of their deck into their graveyard rounded down, allowing us to mill upwards of 30-40 to 40 cards in a single swing while boasting a massive stat block to make trading with it tricky for our opponents, which often allows it to swing in multiple times provided our opponents don't have removal. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. The CMC1 slot brings us our only instant with Otherworldly Gaze, which has us look at the top 3 cards of our deck, send any we want to the grave and the rest to the top of our deck in any order, as well as having flashback for 1 and a blue, which potentially mills us for 6 over the course of the game and gives us the option to keep some of our non-permanents on top and save us from having to recur them to use later. That covers our instant, so let's move on to our sorceries. 
starting in the CMC1 slot, we have its only entrant with increasing confusion. An X spell that mills target player for X, or if we play it for its flashback cost of X and a blue, mills twice that many cards instead. Making it a scalable self-mill effect that gets even better the second time around. We have another single entry in the CMC2 slot with Tracker's Instincts, which has us reveal the top 4 cards of our deck, putting a creature from among them into our hand while sending the rest to the grave, as well as having Flashback for 2 and a blue. Continuing on the self-mill plan while also getting us more frogs to hand to enable Grawlnock further, or even Laboratory Maniac if we're lucky. The CMC3 slot then brings us its pair of entrants with Croak and Counterpart and Dryad's Revival. Croak and Counterpart creates a token copy of target creature, except it's a frog and is a 1-1, as well as having flashback for 3 a green and a blue, serving as both a way to get another frog on board while also potentially making a miniature copy of the most powerful creature on board twice per game. Dryad's Revival lets us return a card from our grave to hand and has flashback for 4 and a green, giving us yet more recursion to ensure our most powerful effects don't stay in the grave for long. Moving on to the CMC4 slot, we have its only entrant with Wash Out, which returns all permanents of the color of our choice back to their owner's hands, potentially serving as a one-sided wipe to help slow down the game and buy us more time to mill ourselves against more established boards. The CMC5 slot then brings us our second to last sorcery with Traumatize, which simply has target player put the top half of their deck into their grave rounded down, like Fleet Swallower before it, allowing us to dump a huge portion of our deck all at once and speeding up our self-mill plan massively while doing so. Finally, the CMC6 slot brings us our last sorcery with River's Rebuke, which returns all non-land permanents target player controls to their hand, making it a powerful player-specific wipe to devastate the player in the lead's board while buying us more time to finish milling ourselves out, which will be much easier after this resolve since our frogs will have a free attack on them since they'll have no blockers online. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. The CMC1 slot's single entry is Crop Sigil, which mills us for 1 on our upkeep and, if we have Delirium, lets us pay 2, a green, and sack it to return up to 1 creature and 1 land back from our grave to our hand, serving as a cheap source of free mill each turn that can also recur Laboratory Maniac if needed to be cast again for another layer of security for one of our win cons. The CMC2 slot then brings us a whole suite of transformation auras with Frogify, Kazmina's Transformation, Kenrith's Transformation, and Lingify, all of which have the enchanted creature lose all its abilities and changes its base stats, the first turning the target into a 1-1 blue frog, the second into just a 1-1, the third into a 3-3 elk but also draws us a card when it comes into play, and the last into a 0-4 tree folk, all of which serve as a great way to turn our opponent's commanders into paperweights, or simply make swinging into our opponent's board states that much safer as we shrink their best creatures. Some mill options then join us with Chronic Flooding and Drowned Secrets. Chronic Flooding is an aura that enchants a land, causing the land's owner to mill 3 every time it's tapped, giving us a free mill 3 per rotation as we generate mana which we'll gladly take. Drowned Secrets has target player mill 2 whenever we cast a blue spell, hitting the board early and taking advantage of our slightly blue skewed deck to add even more self mill as we cast our spells. Then we end this slot with Druid Class, a class enchantment that at level 1 gains us a life whenever we play a land, at level 2, which costs 2 and a green, lets us put an additional land into play, and at level 3, which costs 4 and a green, has target land to turn into a creature with haste whose power and toughness is equal to the number of lands we control. It's level 2 being the most important for us, allowing us to get the many lands we'll be milling into play from exile that much faster, but its life gain being a nice bonus and the creature it creates being a devastating beat stick if we need to go on the offense. Moving on to the CMC3 slot and our last few enchantments, we start off with a few additional mill sources with Court of Cunning, Crawling Infestation, and Crawling Sensation. Court of Cunning, when it ETBs, makes us the Monarch, and on our upkeep, mills any number of players for 2 or 10 instead if we're the Monarch, both serving as a source of card advantage outside of our commander and even more free mill, which is especially good if we're able to hold on to the crown. Crawling Infestation and Crawling Sensation both let us mill ourselves for 2 on our upkeep and create a 1-1 one, one green insect token depending on what we milled, a creature for the former and a land for the latter, each being limited to once per turn, each giving us yet more mill each turn and getting us extra bodies on board as it does so, incentivizing us to use our instant speed mill on our opponent's turns to get even more bugs into play. Some green enchantments then join us with Rites of Flourishing, Broken Fall, and Molting Skin. Rites of Flourishing has each player draw an extra card on their draw step and play an additional land per turn, its symmetrical extra land dropping effect being more useful to us than our opponents since we'll be able to play lands we've milled from exile, and the extra draw helping us chew through our deck that much faster. Broken Fall and Molting Skin both let us return them to our hand to regenerate target creature, the pair serving as repeatable sources of protection against targeted removal, initially for our commander and later for Laboratory Maniac. Then we close out our enchantments with some blue entrants, those being Imprisoned in the Moon and Arcane Adaptation. 
Imprisoned in the Moon is an aura that can enchant a creature, a land, or a planeswalker, turning the enchanted permanent into a colorless land that taps for a colorless and loses all other abilities, making it an absolutely devastating removal option, especially when dealing with commanders, sidelighting them possibly for the rest of the game unless our opponents are able to remove the aura or have a way to destroy their own lands. Arcane Adaptation has us choose a creature type when it ETBs, then adds that creature type to all our creatures, giving us a cheeky way to turn mana dorks, tokens, and other utility creatures into frogs for a high amount of mill to help us close out games, all for only 3 mana. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. The CMC 1 slot starts us off with Sol Ring, which we can tap for 2 colorless, making it a potent ramp source that we can play from hand or exile on the cheap to get a good amount of ramp at any stage of the game. Then we close out this slot with some self-milling artifacts, those being Codex Shredder, Wanda Vertebrae, and Ghoul Caller's Bell. Codex Shredder lets us tap it to mill a player for one, or we can pay five, tap it and sack it to return target card from our graveyard to our hand, serving the dual purpose of a repeatable instant speed mill effect and a recursion piece. Wanda Vertebrae lets us tap it to mill ourselves for one, or we can pay two, tap it and exile it to shuffle five cards from our grave back into our deck. Again, serving as another flash speed mill source, but also an emergency abort button in case we lose our win con and we're about to mill ourselves out to hopefully get another turn. Ghoul Caller's Bell lets us tap it to have each player mill one, giving us yet more instant speed mill and occasionally serving as some top deck disruption in the occasional matchups where that may matter. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we begin with Swiftfoot Boots and Ring of Evos Isle, both being equipment that equip for one and protect the equipped creature from targeting, the former by granting it Hexproof as well as Haste, and the latter allowing us to pay two to give it Shroud until the end of the turn, as well as giving it a plus one plus one counter on our upkeep if it's blue, both serving as decent sources of targeting protection for Grawlnock while getting him into combat faster or going him bigger to more easily survive attacking respectively. Then we close out this slot with Perpetual Timepiece, which we can tap to mill ourselves for two, or pay two and exile it to shuffle any number of cards from our grave back into our deck, making it a better Wand of Vertebrae that mills us for more and can still save us from decking ourselves out even if we use it to mill ourselves earlier in the turn. A pair of entrants then join us as we enter the CMC3 slot, those being Whisper Silk Cloak and Desecrated Tomb. Whisper Silk Cloak is an equipment that equips for two and makes the equipped creature unblockable, as well as granting it Shroud, working nicely in the early game to allow Grawlnock to safely swing in for damage while protecting him from removal, and in the later game to keep Laboratory Maniac alive as we mill our final few cards. Desecrated Tomb creates a 1-1 Black Bat token with flying whenever one or more creatures leave our graveyard, allowing us to produce an absurd amount of evasive tokens as our frogs swing in to help us screen attacks or swing in themselves if we can transform them into frogs for additional mill. Through a card like Masswood Nexus, our only CMC4 entrant and last artifact, that makes all creatures we control all creature types, as well as letting us pay 3 and tap it to create a 2-2 blue shapeshifter token with Changeling, like Arcane Adaptation before it, having the ability to turn all our tokens into additional mill sources, while also being able to produce more bodies as well. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Both this deck's Planeswalkers join us in the CMC4 slot, those being Jace Wielder of Mysteries and Tamiyo Collector of Tales. Jace Wielder of Mysteries comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. His passive wins us the game if we were to draw a card from our deck while having no cards in it, his plus 1 mills a player for 2 then draws us a card, and his minus 8 draws us 7 cards and wins us the game if we have no cards left in our deck, serving as another self-milling win con that helps mill us with both of his abilities, which is exactly what this build wants. Tamiyo Collector of Tales comes into play with 5 loyalty and has the following abilities. Her passive prevents all spells our opponents control from forcing us to discard cards or sack permanents. Her plus 1 has us name a card, reveal the top 4 cards of our deck, and put any card with that name into our hand while sending the rest to our grave, and her minus 3 returns a card from our grave back to our hand. Her passive serving as a decent way to protect our frogs and win cons from being discarded away or sacked for some situational but appreciated protection, while her abilities provide us with additional mill and recursion, both of which suit our game plan just fine. That covers both our Planeswalkers, so let's move on to our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Yavamaya Coast, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, Vine Glimmer Snarl, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal an island or forest and taps for either of our colors, Temple of Mystery, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and scries one when it ETBs, Quandrix Campus, which comes into play tapped, taps for both our colors and we can pay 4 and tap it to scry 1. Blighted Woodland and Myriad Landscape, both of which tap for a colorless and let us tap them and sack them to put 2 basic lands from our deck into play tapped, the former costing 3 and a green to do this, and the latter coming into play tapped and being limited to the same basic, but costing 2 to do this instead. And finally Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped. Moving on to our utility lands, the first half brings us Ipnu Rivulet and Ghost Quarter. 
Ipnu Rivalet taps for a colorless or a blue instead if we lose a life, as well as letting us pay one, a blue, tap it and sack it to have target player mill four cards, giving us some cheap extra mill from the land slot to help us mill out those last few cards in the end game when needed. Ghost Quarter also taps for colorless and we can tap it and sack it to destroy target land, having its owner replace it with a basic from their deck, giving us a decent way to snipe out any problematic utility lands our opponents may have. The latter half of our utility lands then close out with Rogue's Passage and Tyrite Sanctum. Rogue's Passage taps for colorless and we can pay 3 and tap it to make target creature unblockable until the end of the turn, ensuring our commander and other non-evasive frogs can still get in for attacks even on stalled board states to continue milling us. Tyrite Sanctum also taps for colorless and lets us either pay 2 and tap it to add the god subtype to target legendary creature and give it a plus 1 plus 1 counter, or pay 4, tap it and sack it to give target god an indestructible counter. Both helping us mechanically by making Grawlnock bigger and eventually indestructible to survive attacking in, as well as thematically by turning our giant frog commander into the god both his cultists and we know him to be. Finally, we're running 12 islands and 11 forests as our basics to close out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 28 creatures including the commander, 1 instant, 7 sorceries, 16 enchantments, 10 artifacts, 2 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 14 frogs or effects that create frogs, 23 sources of mill or self-mill, 5 cards that care about milling ourselves, 6 sources of recursion, and 7 sources of protection. Leaving us with enough frogs to enable our commander, as well as plenty of other ways to mill ourselves, a handful of ways to benefit from doing so, including winning the game, a decent number of ways to recur our resources from the grave if destroyed or milled, and a good number of ways to keep our commander and win cons alive. For general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 2 card draw sources, 10 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our draw being absurdly low since Skrullnock effectively turns all our cards in exile into a second hand with no hand limit, which greatly lessens the need for a normal draw, while our other core stats are right about where we want to see them. Looking at our mana curve, we have 11 1 drops, 16 2 drops, 23 drops, 12 4 drops, 3 5 drops, 1 6 drop, and 1 7 drop leaving us with an aggressive curve that aims to get our smaller frogs and protection sources out early, followed by Grawlnock to enable a self-mill plan as soon as possible, keeping him alive to use our exile as a resource until we mill ourselves out with a self-mill wincon on board. Currently, this deck is valued at 64.60, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Barog Befuddler, Galloping Lizrog, and Trollbred Guardian are all decent budget frogs to add if you feel like the build needs more to support Karlnock, while Jesus Erasure, Seder Wayfinder, and Drowned in Dreams are all great sources of extra mill if you find the core build lacking. For upgrades, Thassa's Oracle serves as another win con for this build when our library gets low enough for some extra redundancy. Azusa Lost But Seeking, Wayward Swordtooth, and a Psy Tyrant of Gyre Strait all serve as creature-based sources of additional land drops, all of which help us get our lands from exile into play faster, while Exploration serves as another way to do this minus the body. Hedron Crab, Mesmeric Orb, and Hermit Druid all make for excellent sources of repeatable mill to help us deck out faster, as well as Fraying Sanity, which effectively doubles all our self-mill once it's on us. Finally, Intuition effectively tutors up a card to hand and two to exile at instant speed to search up our win conditions, which ironically cost several times less than it. I guess that's what they mean by diminishing returns. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to welcome the newest 100 subs to the channel that helped us crack the 2.6k milestone. Thank you and our older subscribers as well, as we would not be at this point without your continued support. Moving on to the results of last week's poll, after a hard-fought race, Eruth Tormented Prophet was able to just edge out Torrens and claim the top spot, which of course she foresaw all along, so look forward to a spell-slinging impulse draw-focused build featuring her next week. Now looking at this week's poll, the contenders will be a mixed bag of old and new entrants to help shake up the votes. So the entrance this week will be Torrin's Fist of the Angels for his performance in last week's poll, Jeroth Visionary Stitcher to see if he can get a deck tech to join his sister, and Audric the Bloodcursed has some fresh blood that will be making his own as well. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders from Crimson Vow you'd like to see in a future poll. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Carl for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Carl, and thanks for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.